right, so um, what is imperialism? So imperialism is going to first start. It starts immediately as military imperialism. Okay? What is military imperialism? Can anyone raise your hand and tell me what a military imperialism is? Oh, we have no idea. What do you got? Huh? Um, okay, sort of, to a degree, okay? All of a sudden, the world is getting a lot more complicated as we move faster and faster through history, correct? Civil war is over. We already have the United States already in Japan. All these things are happening. People want to start having stations all over the world, correct? You need to refuel your ships. We have gasoline-powered ships, oil-based ships now, so we need ports to park them, correct? So military imperialism is the starting of ports for our ships to land and port through. So eventually they're going to change to economics. So it starts as a military need, then it starts to an economic desire. Do we see the change? Okay. U.S. imperialism is straight up going to be uh, military imperialism. When we talk about Guam today, Guam is one of the largest marine base uh, marine uh, bases in the world. Okay, it's one of the largest ones. Why? Because we see it as our uh, western wall to Asia. Okay, same thing with what will become the Philippines. So, motivations. It starts with military, goes to political, okay? Economic, of course. Capitalism is the biggest drive. We need resources, we need markets, we need goods. Okay, religious to a degree. Religion is kind of fading out, but we still have some enthusiastic people who want to go spread the word of God. Have you read the Poison One Bible yet? I think you're going to read it your junior year. Uh, it's okay. It's about a real diehard Christian who goes into the jungles of Africa, and their religion is going to be challenged just because of the horrors they see due to imperialism, uh, seeing the way white people are treating the natives and stuff like that. That's going to be religious-based. Demographic, we're going to see. We need criminal populations. Where are they going? Australia is going to be our largest port, of course and dissident populations, if you are kicked out of England for political reasons, they're going to send you to Australia as well. Okay, so, manifest destiny. You already heard about this. You don't need to write everything down, guys. You already know. What is manifest destiny? What country is using manifest destiny, Sarah? America, absolutely. And it's our justification for doing what? Expanding and going west, absolutely. We're going to be looking for gold. We're going to be looking for land. All right, we're looking for opportunity. So heading west, uh, expansion of markets. Over in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, the uh, markets are going to be super saturated. So when our foreigners get to these markets, they're not going to have a lot of opportunity to set their own jobs, create. So what are they going to do? They're going to start moving west, and the United States is going to continue to spread. What is going to allow Manifest Destiny to really get a huge jump start? What piece of technology is going to allow the western movement to go really fast? Trains. There you go. Once we have the westward train. So, keep in mind, some other things we need to think about. Waterways, supply stations, and imperial rivalries are going to be strategic. The next, This is the end of period five. Please stop and listen. This is the end of period five. Next week, uh, we have riding week. Then the week after that, we have World War I. So what does that mean this week is going to be happening? Conflict, yes, we got some straight up rivalries here, some ones that are ancient, okay, some that are going to be now straight up economically based. So keep in mind, the next time we go through a lecture, it's going to be World War I, <laughs> which I'm so excited about, we're just going to go around killing everybody, it's going to be great. So we have to start building that tension and that conflict. So you need to write this down, this is a very big thing. So the white man's burden, what a... What a phrase. It's written by Rudyard Kipling. Does anyone know the name of his book? It's not called The White Man's Burden. You read it. You've seen the movie. They just re-released it. It's a Disney movie. Have you ever read The Jungle Book? Or seen the movie The Jungle Book? That's Rudyard Kipling. And in that, he's teaching you that the white men have a responsibility to help the brown and black people of this world because they can't do it themselves. So by going to watch that movie, you're buying into the white man's burden, by the way. Fun fact. I have yet to see it, thanks. Okay, so Rudyard Kipling is going to this whole white man's burden. What that means is it is the European responsibility 
to inject themselves into the politics, economics, and cultural impacts of everyone not European. It's very pro-European or anti-European? Very much pro, okay? Okay, so what's going to happen is that they see themselves as fixing society. They're going out and doing the right thing. This is going to be a very, very popular justification for imperialism. And it's going to be done by uh, Kipling. So, domestic issues. Uh, we've got crises of industrializ uh, industrialization. Keep in mind, is industrialization easier or hard on a population? It's very, very hard. They go through a ton of resources. We have pressure from socialism, okay? I think we can all agree if you're working 14 hours in a factory getting paid like crap, you're going to want to have this idea of that I get my equal share, correct? Not seeing the owner and stuff like that. So we have imperial policies, seal roads, imperialism is an alternative to civil war. You need to know that. So to seal roads is going to be a very famous white Europeanist, and he is very pro industrialization and imperialism, and he believes the best way that we can keep control over our population and avoid socialism is to, in fact, imperialize other countries. What that means is that our European brethren are going to benefit off the backs of these Africans and these Chinese, okay? So by stealing their stuff and making our own country wealthier, we're going to keep ourselves in power. That's essentially what it comes down to. All right, so technology, you have to have steamships, okay? Why are steamships such a big deal? What do they do? Hey. Yeah, it makes it much faster, correct? So we also have railroads, but more importantly, we have the Suez Canal, and you need to write this down because this is going to be a big damn deal. Now, the Suez Canal is going to be built in 1859 to 1869. It originally is going to be built by the Egyptians, so I would write down this order, built by Egyptians, parentheses, fail, then the French, guys, you need to be writing down Suez Canal, that's the biggest one, you should already know your railroads, okay, Suez Canal, it's built by the Egyptians, fail, then it's built by the French, semi-fail, and then the English swoop in and finish it. So... Egyptians start it, it fails. The French swoop in, semi-fail, and the British swoop in, bail out the French, and ta-da, there they go. So, where is the Suez Canal? Can anyone raise your hand and tell me where it is? Where is it? Uh, Fulton. It's right next to the Arabian Peninsula. It's sort of like the peninsula itself. It's like a shark down the There you go. So, the reason why it is a very big deal is because, um, for the first thing, the biggest thing is that it is going to allow uh, worldwide trade to come through. If you control the Suez Canal, you control the face of the world. Suez Canal is the most traveled piece of water in the entire world. It's literally right next to Egypt. If you look over here, okay? Have you ever seen that movie with Tom Hanks where they get the pirates and make them with the cargo ship? Yeah, and then he gets like amazing, crazy shot. Down the Okay. Alright, so this is where the Suez Canal right here. Uh, instead of having to go from England all the way around the tip of Africa to get to India, all of a sudden now to get to England you just go into the Mediterranean, cut through the Red Sea, and cut it through there. Now only, instead of six months, it takes two and a half weeks. Is that a substantial change? Absolutely. So because of that. Now, if you control the Suez Canal, guess what you control? Control trade. You can stop people from coming through, and you can allow people to come through. And guess what? Guess who's getting paid for every time a ship goes through? The English. So, guess what is going to be the most sought-after piece of land in the entire world? Suez Canal, because no one else is making money like they are. Panama Canal is also going to be built. Who builds the Panama Canal? The U.S. Absolutely. Now, the Panama Canal is down here in Central America. It's going to be down here in Panama. Why do we pick Panama? It's the thinnest, absolutely. The connection between the Pacific and the Atlantic is only like a mile and a half. 
The only problem is, is that the Pacific is about six to eight feet taller than the Atlantic. Is that fine? Yeah. So build a log system and stuff like that. So instead of having to go all around the tip, the tip of <coughs> South America, now you can just cut straight through. It's going to make worldwide travel. Why did we build it there? Because we control trade in the Western Hemisphere. We decide who's trading and who's not. We are the ones who build it. We give it back to them about 10 years ago because it was in the contract. All right, weaponry. We do have uh, uh, we do have firearms that are shooting at a much faster rate, the Maxim gun. All you need to know is we have guns that are fast. Like, you just need to know that our technology is advancing at a very fast rate. That's what you need to know. I wouldn't stress yourself out too much about it. Okay? Now, what uh, one of the big... Wars or battles, Battle of Ordam, just listen to it. It's in 19, 1898, five hours of fighting, that's it. The British have six gunboats, 20 machine guns. The British only lost a few hundred men. They killed thousands of Sudanese. Thousands. Like, I think it's like up to like 60,000 Sudanese. And they lost maybe 90 people. Okay? What does that show you? Is there a balance of power or a completely unbalanced power? complete unbalance of power in Africa. Now, after this battle, okay, it is concrete that the Europeans have the straight up advantage. That's why you need to know, and it's going to be a major thing. Now, keep, just listen. Correspondence. The British are going to be able to, in 1830, it takes two years to get a letter, okay, from Britain to India to get it back, okay? Now, after the Suez Canal, it only takes two weeks, Okay, to get a letter there and back. That's how fast things are moving now. The telegraph, okay, we're going to have that. You can reach, Bryn can reach India in five hours. And the information can get back. So please listen, put a big star. Correspondence improvements with telegraph, correspondence improvements with telegraph allow direct control of colonies by imperial governments. Correspondence technology, like the telegraph, allow imperial colonies direct control. So if it only takes five hours, do you think the British Crown is going to have more power or less power? More. Beforehand, they had the big gap, which is why the Americans could rebel in the American, Civil, American Revolution, correct? We had, it took six months to get the message there, six months, three months to get a military together, six months back over the sea, okay? So we had about a year and a half before the king could really do anything about us protesting, correct? With this, it's five hours. The king of England is involved in everything. Queen Victoria is actually involved in most of it because it's a queen for most of the high points. Uh, and she's in direct control, which is pretty crazy. So, the British India. So, write down capital of British India. You're going to have a bunch of meetings to write down. So, East India Trade Company has been there since period three, end of three, four is the full blown. Four, it's full blown. So, monopoly on Indian Ocean trade, of course, because they defeat the uh, Dutch in what war? Seven years war, they get the Indian Ocean Basin. Okay, they originally were there with the Mughal Empire saying, yes, please, come trade with us. We want the money and want the wealth. Okay, eventually they decline in 1707. So <coughs> guess who rises into power? The British. The British are officially the occupying force in 1707. Okay, originally there with the Mughal Empire's approval. Okay, however, so... What we're going to see is that they believe that they have to protect their economic interests. So what they do is they hire British, uh, they hire Indian soldiers to fight for the British, and they're called sepoys. You need to know that term. They are Indian bred boys, they're Indian, who fight for the British. They're called sepoys. They're going to play a big part here in a second. Okay. Why would an Indian fight for this occupying power? Oh, they get paid really, really, really well. Think about it. You're essentially betraying your own brethren to get paid. So you have to pay really well, and that's exactly what they do. So, now, just like everything else, everywhere is revolting against the occupying power. Do not think for a second that China's just sitting there. We already know that China's not sitting there kindly, right? Happy with the Europeans. We have the Taping Rebellion, which is over a million people. 
Okay, we have the Boxer Rebellion, which is all over. Now, in India, we have the Sepoy Rebellion. You definitely need to know this. It's going to happen in 1857. Okay, there is going to be a rumor started that says that the gun... So, anyone here own a gun? Anyone have a gun family? Okay, how often do you clean your guns? Uh, after you shoot them. Every time. How often are you guys shooting? Uh, every oh, there you go. So, are you good at cleaning them? I'm not very good. No. I'm going to clean certain guns, not John. Okay. Well, it's well on my knowledge. Yeah. I apparently have like six guns in my house. I have no idea. I've never held one. My husband grew up in Virginia and he got shooting every once in a while. Anyway, so when you clean, so the guns that Dylan shoots, he has synthetic grease. So every time he shoots them, he has to clean them. Obviously, uh, he doesn't use them. He uses them pretty regularly, but most of us don't. My husband uses them maybe like two or three times a year. Anyway, every time you use them, you got to clean them. Synthetic grease, which means it's not made from animal byproduct. But back then, guess what they used? Animal byproduct. So it's actual animal fat that they put on the grease of the guns in order to keep the machines from uh, locking up. But that being said, there was a rumor started that said that the grease was pig grease. Now, pig grease goes against what... Uh, religion. What religion in India can't uh, eat pigs? Hindu, uh, not Hindus. Islam. I um, Muslims do not eat pig. So there's a rumor saying that the grease was actually pig grease. Then there was another rumor that said the grease was actually cow. So who was offended then? Hindus. And then both of these major religions, which we know, of course, are all over India, were like, oh my god, the British are disrespecting us. They're giving us these weapons. We actually don't know what Greece they're from. Uh, we believe there actually is cow grease, because they're going to have a ton of cows. But they also have a ton of pigs, so we're not really sure what Greece was there historically. Um, however, we're going to see that it's going to upset the two major religions in India. So those two religions are well represented in the Sepoy, so the British fighting force. And both of them are going to rebel because they believe the British were being completely disrespectful to them and their religion. A uh, small-scale rebellion, however, it's going to ignite this whole anti-British thing. It's a small rebellion in the grand scheme of things. Okay, it's only maybe... Uh, 3,000 people. Keep in mind, the taping rebellions of a million people, so keep in mind the scale. However, from this point forward, and I put a big star next to this, all Indians are anti-British. All Indians, whether you're Hindu, whether you're Sikh, whether you're Muslim, they become anti-British. Okay? This is going to force the British to have uh, military in all of its British ports, so it's now going to be no, uh, not only economic, uh, but also military imperialism. To the boards, here we go. Oh my god, I can't breathe. On your whiteboard, what do we call Indian soldiers who fight for the British? Good, what is it, Melu? Sepoys, on your whiteboard, please tell me. The, uh, the British were there in India with the approval of what Indian Empire? The British were in India with the approval of what Brit uh, Indian Empire? What do we got, Sarah? Mughal. What is the crown accomplishment of the Mughal Empire? Fun fact. You should know this. We're coming up on AP Review. What is the crowning accomplishment of the Mughal Empire? It's absolutely beautiful, and I want to see it before I die. Good. No, not gunpowder. What is it, Jamal? Taj Mahal. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is going to allow imperialist powers to have more direct control over their empires? What is going to give imperial powers more direct control? Adi. Telegraph. Telegraph. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is going to give the British control over worldwide trade? What gives the British control over worldwide trade? Good. What is it, Gunner? Suez Canal. On your whiteboard, the United States build what canal? And control it and regulate it and make millions off of it. 
I want to go on a, like a cruise or something through this place because apparently it's really cool with the lock system. Like you go into an area and if you're going from the Pacific to the Atlantic, they drain water and then you go into the next lock and then they drain it and you go in the next lock and then they drain it. And if you're going from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific, then you go in and then they flood it and your boat rises and then you go in and then they flood it and the boat rises. Isn't that cool? Yeah. It is so cool. What is it, Cade? Panama Canal. Panama Canal. On your whiteboard, please tell me what are the two reasons why Europeans are in uh, Canada. No, Europeans are in Canada at this point. But in China and Africa, what are the two reasons? I already asked you this question earlier today. I just want to make sure there's two major reasons why they're here. I gotta get woozy. I can't breathe. Karishma, what are they? There you go. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the gentleman who wrote the argument, The White Man's Burden? And also, maybe one of your favorite Disney stories, The Jungle Book. No. Who is it? Nope. Who is it? Callie. Rudyard Kipling. Who believes that by imperializing, Europeans are, European powers are keeping themselves in power because the people are not going to overthrow. That it's simply to keep them in power. Who is it? Who is it, Patrick? Cecil, Cecil Rhodes. Keep in mind, guys, Cecil Rhodes believed that European powers, like monarchs, want to stay in power, so they're going to keep imperializing. Does that make sense? Rudyard Kipling believes it's just a white person's responsibility because we're more sad, uh, we're smarter, more intelligent than uh, your Africans or your Asians, which is why we should go in and take over. All right. Uh, the Sepoy Rebellion is a me begins because of conflict over what? The Sepoy Rebellion believe, uh, begins over conflict over what? Good. What is it, Alex? Animal grease. Here we go. All right. So, outcome of the Sepoy Rebellion. Now, the Sepoy Rebellion is a small uh, outbreak, but it allows the British to start choking India. Okay, beforehand, they were just kind of like pinning India to the wall, and now they're choking India. Okay, so with that being said, they completely abolish the Mughal Empire, which is pretty funny. Okay, because they're an outside power saying that you can't have a government anymore. So... They exile the emperor to Burma, okay, which is over by Thailand. They abolish the East India Trade Company. Why do they abolish it? Dylan. Because now that the, the British government is like the literal monarchs, they don't need it. Absolutely. They don't need it, and they don't want that rival of power, remember? The British, East India British Trade Company, they could wage war, make their own money. Uh, they could sign treaties, all that stuff. They don't want the competition amongst themselves, so they completely eradicate, just like Dylan said, and they establish direct rule of India by the British, which means whatever the government says, the Indians have to do, okay? There's no longer a emperor that's being told what the British, they've already kicked him out, so it's just a white guy, the emperor of, Ang of India is a white guy that says, all of you Indian people, you will now do this, okay? Have you ever seen Anna and the King? Why do I ask these questions? What the hell do you people watch? It's also a Disney movie, by the way. Just, huh? Anyway. So, organization. So, there is something called the Sugar Knife of Britain. Write that down. The Sugar Knife of Britain. What that means, you're going to want to write this down, is that British occupation in India has pros and cons. The British occupation of India has pros and cons. First of all, the positives are, is that they build bridges. You're going to want to write this down, the pros. They build bridges. Improve irrigation. And uh, infrastructure, improve infrastructure, and build railroads. Okay, so bridges, railroads, infrastructure, and irrigation. 
the British bring that all to India, which is going to improve India tenfold. Okay? So those are the pros. Okay? The cons is they start destroying India culture, uh, culture, independence, and they destroy the Indian economy. How do they destroy the Indian economy? What do you got, Brian? Huh? Okay, they're gonna for you. Well, they're kind of growing opium before. They're gonna do it in a major way. Okay, Tristan. They abuse it and take all the natural. Absolutely, they're just gonna take kick all the Indians who own the land off, and they're gonna claim it as their own. Okay, and that's going to disrupt the economy as well as what are they going to stop them from doing? Industrializing. Why don't they want them to industrialize, Patrick? They don't have the power to revolt, and does Britain need India to industrialize? No, we need them to produce all the raw materials, so in Britain doesn't allow them to industrialize. That's a major con. India does not industrialize until the 1970s. Okay, so when we think about India today, do we think of it as a very clean country or a very dirty country? Why? They don't have the reforms yet because remember, when you industrialize, you about have about a hundred years or about eighty years of chaos. Correct? Dirty pollution, very little regulation, very tough living conditions. After about the seventy to eighty year mark, you start having social reforms. Well, they just industrialized in the seventies. Have they really gotten to their reforms yet? Not yet, which is why India is considered a pretty dirty country, not as bad as some other newly industrialized countries who didn't industrialize till the nineties. So we have other countries that are well behind. So, Central Asia, okay, they're going to be competing with English, British, and Russians. They're going to have a little bit of impact in China, okay. The French are going to drop out after Napoleon, okay. They got a lot of problems back home. They got to start addressing those problems, okay. They're going to try... We started having this thing called the Great Game, and you're going to want to write that down. It is British versus Russian. This is your first, like, Cold War tech, uh, techniques. You know, some of the games that the Russians are playing with us today, yes? With all of the spying and espionage the Russians are doing on us. Keep in mind, we're also doing the same things to them, so now let's be a little fair. But the great game is going to be competing about Afghanistan. So you need to know the great game is Britain and Russia in Afghanistan. And it is a preparation for an imperialist war. They're both trying to get the advantage in Afghanistan without directly fighting each other. However, it never comes to fruition. It never happens because of the Russian Revolution. Okay? It is the rising tension. Uh, they're about ready to go head to head over Afghanistan. However, it never happens because the Russians have a completely collapse of the Russian Revolution. All right, so just listen. You don't need to write too much down. Just listen. Southeast Asia, okay, Thailand, our modern-day Thailand today. The Spanish Philippines is obviously going to come to the United States. We know that. Dutch is going to continue with Indonesia. The British are going to continue trading, taking over a ton of territory. They need the bases. The French are going to get Cambodia. We already saw this in our map, which is why you don't need to write. Okay, they're going to try pushing it. So... All right, Scramble of Africa, this is where we're going to be. This is big stuff. So Scramble of Africa is the nickname for it. You need to know that name because it's on what's used in a DBQ about three years ago, which we'll be seeing next week. Scramble of Africa is the division of Africa amongst European nations. Okay? It was commonly known as the Dark Continent. Now, it's also a racist thing, like when they say the dark, because obviously they're black in Africa. It's also dark because of what? Why, Dylan? Uh, no, they're not really doing terrible. I mean, they're fighting amongst each other, but so are Europeans, correct? And we just... Oh, no, they haven't gotten there yet. We're about ready to begin, right? They don't have industry. They don't have in they're not industrialized yet. So they called it the dark continent because there's no capitalistic markets. There's no industrialization. Nothing's going on there. So it is the land of opportunity for all of you Europeans. So... The British are going to establish a strong presence in Egypt. They're going to build the Suez Canal. They're also going to get the gold and the diamonds. So it's working out pretty well for the English. 
The English are doing everything first, and everyone else is learning from the English, including the United States. Remember, they're the first ones to industrialize. They're the first ones to do everything. So, ancient Africa, as we know, we're going to see that the Europeans are going to be changing up history, saying that the Africans were actually always learning from the Europeans. Is that true? Absolutely not. We know that the Africans have always had very strong empires, correct? A lie. All of these big kingdom of Congo, all that stuff. So they're trying to justify. They're trying to solve the moral problem of imperialization. Because if I go into Munson's house and steal all of his food, am I in the right or am I in the wrong? I'm in the wrong. But if I say the Munson's a terrible human being who beats puppies in his free time, does it justify me being mean to him? Yes, absolutely, and that's what the Europeans are doing. So, they're going to start for the first time during period five, going into the African interior. Beforehand, at, Europeans were always along the what? The coast. They never went in for the first time. They're going into the interior of Africa during period five. When you're a senior, you're going to read a terrible book called The Heart of Darkness which is about a guy who rides in on uh, the Niger River and all the terrible things he sees. He's an imperialist, white imperialist. Okay, so they go in the Nile, the Niger, the Congo, okay? They get information about the interior, okay? We're gonna start seeing King Leopold of Belgium is gonna start making a corporate, you do need to know his name, okay? And they're gonna take control. The Kingdom of Congo is the first internal part of Africa that's going to be colonized. Who can raise your hand and tell me why? We talked about this when we were doing our map on Friday. What is in the Congo? Diamond. You go there too, right? You knew there were plenty of diamonds. So they're going to start there. Once the Kingdom of Congo finds diamonds and sets up their own colony in the internal of Africa and everyone knows there's diamonds there, well, guess what everyone else is going to start doing? They're going to be sending their colonies to the internal interior of Africa and trying to find it. Okay? We'll get there tomorrow. All right, to the boards. Here we go. On your whiteboard, what is the name of the first country to colonize the interior of Africa? What is the name of the first country to colonize the interior of Africa? Who is it, Elizabeth? Belgium. On your whiteboard, what is the king of Belgium called? He is one of three people who own the entire kingdom of Congo. Good. Who is it? Who is it? Cade. King Leopold II. King Leopold II. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is it called when we divide up Africa between all the Europeans? What is the little nickname of the division of Africa by Europeans? Good. No, not imperialism. That's not a nickname. That's the thing. Good. Ding out. Scramble for Africa. On your whiteboard. Who came up with the white man's burden? We had a little bit of issue with this earlier. Who came up with the white man's burden? Good. I got two, three, four. Come on, come on, come on. Who is it, Callie? Rudyard Kipling. Who believed that? Actually, hold on. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is... Uh, the great game is between what two countries? The great game <coughs> is between what two countries? Essentially, all they're doing is doing tit for tat in very basic ways. Doesn't get anywhere. Well, who is it, Alex? British and Russia. British and Russia. In the greatest game, what country is being fought over? They didn't even know there was oil there. Can imagine. Would have gone straight over, uh, straight up. Well, what is it, Walker? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. On your whiteboard, please tell me who did the British take control over in India from in, in 1707 after their collapse and forced uh, to be kicked out. Good. Who is it, Munson? The Mughal. The Mughal. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the most valuable piece of land in the world because it regulates even today world trade what is it daniel suez canal. canal have a good day guys tomorrow we got a lot to do good